our world's uh, philosophical position uh, is awash as we know, and we've talked about it many times. Uh, it's awash in relativism, or the, the belief that there are truths, plural, but no truth. Uh, there's no uh, what we would call a meta-narrative, a story uh, that uh, is the overarching story of all things. Uh, and so what you have is uh, people believe uh, that truth is uh, relative to themselves. So every man basically does as we read at the end of Judges, everything which is right in his own eyes. Uh, and the new commandment, you could make it the 11th commandment, is thou shalt not judge another person's position. Uh, and so that's the world in which we live, where truth is fluid, uh, all positions are supposedly equal, uh, and we must respect all positions no matter what those positions are. Such is not the teaching of scripture. Uh, Francis Schaeffer years ago when he was uh, uh, alive and uh, was writing and teaching, uh, he talked about true truth that there is absolute truth, uh, and that uh, Christianity uh, is built on the premise of what he would call true truth. Uh, God is uh, not uh, about uh, bending and twisting and, and shaping truth to match culture because truth never changes. And so when you read the scriptures, you find out quickly uh, that God's uh, teaching uh, is a series of contrasts, that there are uh, true ways and false ways. There are, uh, there's true spiritual light, there's false moral, um, false, 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 uh, false light. There's uh, spiritual darkness, uh, and there's spiritual truth that to be had. And so the scripture is very clear, it's very definitive of which way a man should think about things. There's, as we see from the writings of Jesus, his first sermon, the, the Sermon on the Mountain, uh, Matthew uh, chapters five to, to seven, Jesus uh, begins by showing us uh, very explicitly that there is a blessed life, which means by implication then there's an unblessed life or a non-blessed life. Uh, and he begins his sermon with multiple blessings uh, on those who seek meekness, who try to be peacemakers, etc. When you, when you look at scripture, as I've said, it's very definitive on uh, absolute uh, truth when it comes to spiritual walking and thinking. Uh, that's a wise way to walk. When you listen to Jesus, he finishes his sermon in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 24 to 28, by saying you can uh, live two ways. You can build your house up on the rock, which is Jesus and, and who he is, or you can build your life on shifting sands, which is everything that the world believes that will not last into eternity because it is not true. Uh, when it comes to how a person gets to God. So you have two options. Uh, Jesus' concepts of, of blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the merciful, etc. is merely a reflection of uh, Psalm 1, which is what we would call a wisdom psalm. Um, a wisdom psalm is designed just to do that. It's supposed to make you wise, not just in reading it, but reading it, thinking about it, and then applying it to your life. Uh, and it is a song uh, that starts out with blessing, blessed are, uh, which is very reminiscent of Jesus, which means uh, as the God-man, Jesus uh, would have spent much time reading and studying Psalm 1 because it's reflected in his very first sermon. Uh, this particular psalm as a wisdom psalm is the first uh, uh, of the many psalms and rightly so because we could say that Psalm 1 is like the gateway to the other 149 psalms. In what way? Well, Psalm 1, which calls us to be wise and not to be foolish in how we approach lives, basically shows that as, as a person is wise and pursues God above all things, then as you read the other Psalms where there's personal lament, uh, where a person's life is falling apart, uh, if you're wise, then you'll have wisdom when your life falls apart. Uh, if, you're, if your life is being richly blessed by God, and it's just blowing your mind how great God is blessing you, if you're walking with God, then his blessing will be on your life, and you'll understand the reason why his blessing is on you. It gives wisdom to you, wisdom. Uh, the very thing that our world lacks greatly is wisdom from God. So there's many psalms that are wisdom psalms. Psalm 10, Psalm 12, Psalm 15, Psalm 19, 32, 34, all the way to the end of the book, Psalm 139 uh, is another wisdom psalm. There's many wisdom psalms which God is telling us, I want you to live wisely. You can live a blessed life or a life that has no blessing of God on it. You must ask yourself, which path am I on? And so that's going to be the, the question that you will, in, you will encounter as you look at Psalm 1, uh, are two paths that a person can walk on, which is again what Jesus talked about in his Sermon on the Mount. There's the narrow path that leads to God, and then there's the broad path that the majority of the people are on that leads to destruction. It's your free choice of which path you're on. Wise people choose the narrow path that leads to God. So 
The question from Psalm 1 is uh, all about blessing, and it's a simple question, uh, and it's basically the question everybody wants to know in life. They just pursue it in all the wrong ways. This question is this. Do you want to have a blessed, meaningful life? Do you want to have a life with the blessing of God on you and rich meaning that you can understand the highs and lows of your life in a meaningful way? Um, who wouldn't want that? And so this is Psalm 1. We'll start with verse 1. The psalmist says, Blessed is the man, which is similar to Jesus' first sermon. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Rather, the law of the Lord is his joy, and on his law he meditates day and night. He, this wise person, is like a tree planted near the streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaves never wither. Whatever he does prospers. Notice the contrast of the foolish person. But not so are the wicked. Uh, they are like chaff driven by the wind. Therefore, the wicked will not arise in the judgment, nor will sinners be in the assembly of the just. Because the Lord knows the way of the just, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Wisdom psalm. You want to be a blessed man or a person that doesn't have the blessing of God on you? You want to have meaning in life and understand life and live it like you're supposed to as a, as a praise to God? Or do you want to live it for yourself and find no ultimate meaning? This particular uh, psalm has uh, what we would call from a literary perspective a chiastic structure. Uh, and you're going to find this all through the psalms. I mentioned it last uh, week as we introduced the psalms. A chiastic structure represents uh, how it's put together. And the emphasis of a chiastic structure is in the middle, uh, the core of the, of, the, of the psalm in question. Uh, and chiasm comes from the, the Greek word, uh, the, the letter ki, uh, uh, which is a cross. Uh, and this particular cross says in the middle is where the emphasis is. So the Spirit of God, when he anointed the, the psalmist to write this psalm, purposely designs it this way so you can focus on the inner message, the main message. You can't miss it. It's B1 and B2, which is the two similes that he puts in here. Blessed is the man. Uh, he's like a prosperous tree. The person who's not blessed, who's a foolish person, he's like worthless chaff. And so God in his wisdom puts at the very core of this psalm uh, the two images for us to think about. And it, when you're speaking, uh, there's... Uh, the way to speak in a more clear fashion is to move down what they call the ladder of abstraction. So if you always talk in the abstract, you lose most people. But as you move down that ladder and you put concrete things in there, stories and word images, people get things better. So God takes images of a, a prosperous tree uh, and says, that I, I want you to think about yourself and ask, ask yourself, is that me? Am I a wise person uh, that is possessing the, the, the knowledge of the Word of God and living by it so that I'm blessed by it? Or am I a person who rejects the things of God and lives for myself and all the things that the world offers? Two paths. You have to ask yourself, which path am I on? Well, the, the psalm uh, helps you answer that question uh, by its analysis. Verses 1 to 3 uh, we, helps us understand what path we're on by considering the path of a wise man. So if I want to understand whether I am wise in God's eyes or not, uh, I have to consider, well, how does he define a wise man? What does he say? He's going to tell us here that a blessed man, a wise man, uh, he's not going to do three things. He's going to give you three negatives, and then he's going to turn and give you the positive side of wise walking. But before he does that, he talks about the person in question, what they get from God being wise. He said, blessed is the man. Now, some translations read, happy is the man. Uh, and that can be misleading because, as we all know, uh, happiness, while it's, it's, it's great to be happy, uh, is an emotion that can be all too fleeting. Uh, and it can go up and down in a given day many times. You can be happy, unhappy. Uh, and that might not be the best translation. Um, a, a blessed person, on the other hand, uh, is one who is so in tune with God uh, in his inner man that no matter what happens to his outer man, uh, he loses his job, uh, he gets sick, uh, th things happen to him. Uh, he has that inner peace that, as we know from Scripture, passes understanding. He's blessed because he understands that God uses all these things for purposes beyond uh, what man can completely grasp, but he gives him wisdom to understand them to a point. So if tragedy uh, befalls that person, he 
he's blessed because he, he grasped that tragedy and learns from it, as Paul did when he had his thorn in the flesh. Um, likewise, when his life is truly blessed, he can grasp those things too and understand from them and have an inner peace that uh, passes understanding. Is that you? As life goes up and down, do you have to stay and study uh, just inner knowledge that God is, is with you because you're, he's made you wise and you're holding uh, on to the hem of his garment and he to you? Uh, a blessed person. Uh, I'd rather be a blessed person than a person who's foolish. But our world is full of people who, who are very foolish. Which one are you? So what does a wise person look like? Well, negatively, uh, there's three things they don't do. Number one, says they steer clear of uh, walking with what he calls the counsel of the wicked. Or translated, a wise person would never think in a situation of going and getting counsel uh, from somebody that does not know God and walk with God. Why? Because their, their counsel is not going to be uh, based in divine spiritual things. They're going to be based in earthly, carnal things. Uh, he's going to surround himself in a positive way with wise counselors. Uh, years ago when I was uh, doing church services uh, in, a, in a youth prison, I encountered many young, young men in the felon ward uh, who had done all kinds of crime. And uh, two, two prisoners one day uh, were uh, sitting in the chair as I was talking to them after the church service. Uh, one had been in the, as a felon for uh, some time. The other one was just arrested. And as they were talking to me, uh, uh, you know, as, as two young men, they were wanting counsel. Uh, but when the young prisoner uh, would turn and talk to the older prisoner, the older prisoner would contradict everything that I said. And so it was totally confusing the young guy who was asking really important spiritual questions. So whatever I would say, uh, it, as wise counsel, the older prisoner, prisoner would undercut what I said. And when I finally turned to the older prisoner and I asked him, I said, uh, what exactly are you attempting to do here? Every time I say uh, X, you say, you know, uh, Y. He, he said, well, I'm, I'm trying to use reverse psychology on this young guy. I go, well, how's that working? Because uh, if you constantly feed him negative things, you're going to undercut his ability to choose things which are right. Uh, such as the counsel uh, of the godless. And I throw in the prisoner term here because when it says they do not seek the counsel of, of the um, the wicked, the word wicked is rasha in Hebrew, which means it's a, it denotes a person who's, uh, who's known for criminal activity. Who in their right mind, uh, if you had a question about who you should marry, this guy or that young lady, uh, should I take this job, that job, uh, who in any kind of situation would go find a criminal and ask them for their input? Uh, the answer, nobody would. Uh, but that's what people do. They go to people uh, who are wicked uh, and they have a lifestyle of living against God and people will go to them and ask them life's big questions. A, a wise person won't do that. So you have to stop and ask yourself as you search for how wise am I, ask yourself, who do you go to for wisdom and counsel? Who are they? Do they love God, follow God, obey God, or do they disrespect God? Uh, all throughout my life, uh, I have purposely uh, gone and chosen different people to be uh, my counselors. Uh, ever since I was a young teenager, I had people in my life that I approached uh, that I would listen to and I would ask questions of as I seek to navigate through life. And not, not that I was perfect by any means, but I knew that I needed help in sorting through the complex questions as a young man. And so I always had people in my life that uh, God kind of put there uh, to speak into my life, to give me wisdom and counsel. Uh, because I didn't want to go after the counsel of godless people and walk away from God and not be blessed. And so um, I could do an entire sermon series on all the people who've spoken into my life over the years, even down to the present. Um, I still have counselors. Like, who does the pastor go to when they have a question? Well, uh, when I need wisdom and counsel, I go to my elder counsel. And I present to them my issues, what I'm thinking about, ask them what they think, because I, I, I revel in their analysis and their understanding of things. But that's a wise person seeks wise counselors. They don't go to people who reject the things of God. Number two, he says that a wise person does not stand in the way of sinners. Uh, standing denotes that you identify with the group you're standing with. Um, the word for sinners is the word hata, which is a word used, uh, uh, it's a military term in, uh, in ancient times. Uh, it was used in Judges chapter 20 verse 16 to denote uh, 
slingers uh, that would throw stones with the slingshot. Uh, they would swing it around and then let go of it and it was tied to one of their little fingers. Uh, and the tribe of Benjamin was known as, as those type of warriors in Israel. Uh, and when they would shoot a stone at a target and miss it, uh, when they were learning how to use the sling, that was called hata, or you missed, the, you missed the target. This became a great word for sin. In fact, it became the word for sin in the Old Testament because sin is missing God's target. So if God says, I want you to do this, and you do this, this is sin because you've not held up God's absolute standard. A wise person uh, doesn't stand around with people uh, who are known for missing the target of what God says is, is righteous and what is holy. Gerald Wilson, a scholar, says of uh, these kinds of people, such persons have not just committed an isolated act of evil, but live lives dominated and shaped by their inclinations. I mean, these are folks who cannot wait to legalize immorality, to call, call immorality morality. These are, these are folks who can't wait to take God's law and turn it on its head and twist it and distort it and call that holy. Again, our world is full of these kind of people. Do you stand in the way of sinners or people who constantly change what God said you should be doing? Uh, next, he says, a wise person does not sit in the company of scoffers. And you can probably see, if you pay attention to the verbiage here, a kind of uh, a descent into evil here. Because it starts out first, you're, you're walking with wicked people. And then you are standing with sinful people. And then your life devolves into, well now you're sitting down with them, totally identified with them, to the point that you have become a scoffer, a mocker of things that are holy. The scriptures call a person who's a mocker, it says in the book of Proverbs that, uh, 9 verse 7, that they are incapable of being corrected because they're arrogant and they think that they're right and they won't take correction. Uh, it says in uh, Proverbs 9, 8, that they will not accept any kind of reproof uh, Proverbs 13.1, uh, Solomon says they, uh, they will not properly handle any rebuke that comes their way. Uh, in Proverbs 14 verse 6, it says that a, a mocking kind of person won't even understand wisdom when it's staring them in the face. They just absolutely reject it. These are vile people. Like the, the people that cursed Christ and mocked Christ as he was being crucified, those are mockers. Those are mockers. Well, how does a person become a mocker and a, and a scorner? Well, they, they do the progression of what's stated here. They walk with e wicked people. They then, they then stand with sinful people that flout God's law. And then the next thing you know, they're joining in the crowd that mock the things of God outright. Peter Atkins is an Oxford chemistry professor uh, who does not think too much of God. Uh, he wrote once, Humanity should accept the, the, that science uh, has eliminated the justification for believing in cosmic purpose and that any survival of purpose is inspired only by sentiment. See, that's, that's the words of an educated a mucker, a scorner. Uh, what he doesn't admit is that science is extremely limited and so far as science can only tell us what is, it can't tell us why it is. It can just look at what is, it can't tell us why it is. It takes theology to tell us why it is, and that's the big question of, that man wants to know. I can see what is, but why is it here? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Uh, the Psalms are there to make a person wise into why you are here. You're created to praise God and glorify him, but a mocker throws that all to the wind. On a positive side, what is a wise person like? It says in verse 2, uh, he says, rather, on a positive side, the law of the Lord is this person's joy. Uh, and on his law, the wise person, he says, meditates day and night. This is a positive side of a wise person. So we've already seen the three things they, they, they don't do as a lifestyle. Now what do they do on the positive side? Well, they, they love the law of God. Well, what is the law? Well, that could be the Torah. The, what's the Torah? Well, the Torah, the law of God, could be the first five books of the Old Testament. In fact, that's what it typically represents. So all the things that are contained in there from God, from Genesis through Deuteronomy, that law, uh, the, the person that loves God and wants to be wise, studies those books, pours over them to try to understand God's heart and mind so they can, they can obey the, the things that are listed there. That's the, the, the Torah. But the Torah is bigger than that. 
uh, as we know through progressive revelation, the Torah basically covers the entire Old Testament, and now by way of revelation, the New Testament as well. And so what does the, the person who's wise do? It says that they, they find great joy in the law of God, or from our vernacular we could say, they, they love their Bible. They love their Bible, and how often do they read it or think about it? Well, he says they, they meditate on it day and night. That, that is a figure of speech called a merism. And a merism uh, takes two extremes uh, and states them in such a way that it, it co- encompasses everything in between that. Uh, we use these uh, all the time. We just, we don't know what they're called. We just use them. So I'll give a few uh, modern day merisms to you. And you can see how these are just uh, rhetorical devices they used in ancient times. Uh, if you want to say some, somebody uh, swallowed something completely, like an idea, you would say they bought that hook, line, and sinker. That's the whole thing. That's a merism. Um, if you want to say that you, you looked everywhere for your car keys, uh, you would say, well, well, well honey, I, I searched high and low for my car keys. That's, that's a merism. You're saying, I, I've covered everything. This is what the psalmist does. He takes a merism and he says, how often does a wise person think about God and his word? A lot, a lot. It's, it's his mindset. It's his mindset. He thinks about God and he reads about God and he studies about God. This is, uh, I don't know if I've ever showed this to you and I wish you were sitting here uh, so you could see it like right here. Uh, this is my Bible from a college. Uh, I was given this uh, by my parents when I graduated from high school in 1976. Uh, and... I took it all through college, I took it all through Dallas Seminary, uh, off into my first pastorate, and eventually it, it started falling apart on me, uh, pages started falling out, which you don't want to lose uh, pages out of God's Word. Uh, I, you know, it got to the point where I couldn't use it anymore, so I had to uh, set it off to the side and get a new Bible. But if you were to take my Bible from when I was a, a young man uh, through my, my teens uh, and through my 20s and, and early 30s, uh, you would see that I spent a lot of time reading this because of all the notes in it. I mean, I focused on the Word of God. I mean, I thought about it. It doesn't mean that, you know, I couldn't work because I'm reading my Bible, but, but it's my lifestyle is to think about it. So if you are truly wise in God's ways, you're going to be excited about the Word of God because it's going to feed your soul. Like uh, this morning I got up, 6 o'clock, uh, and I've, you know, I've already studied for my sermon. I know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and you know, I, c- I could go, up, go about my morning doing other things, uh, but I got up at 6, got a cup of coffee, sat down in the living room by myself, uh, and spent an hour reading the Psalms. Just listening to them, listening to God, what God has to say, asking questions, uh, looking for insight, uh, l- listening to what God might have to say that I might need to bring into my sermon today. Just listening to him, thinking about him. It's meditation. Meditation uh, is interesting. It's, we don't do that a lot in our culture anymore, uh, thinking uh, for very long about any one given concept. But a person who meditates on the Word of God purposely structures their day so they spend time in it, and they don't find it laborious. I mean, they find it exciting because they're going to find answers from God there. He's going to speak to them. And this is what we do as we meditate. The, the word for meditate in Hebrew is the word haggah. Uh, and it denoted the sound a Jew would make as they read the Torah. Because they didn't do it uh, silently. They would, as they would read it uh, in the Hebrew, uh, they said the sound of them reading it as they would mumble sounded like haggah. And so if you heard that low mumble of haga, 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 it was like, that kind of sounds like they're meditating. And that's what it is. It's that pouring over it and thinking about it. See, this is uh, what a wise person does. They, they live such a life that they're focused on God's things. They love to be in the word to hear from God. I've told you uh, years ago about, uh, before I moved here, uh, I went to a, um, uh, a monastery. I'd n- Never been to a monastery before. I went there with some other pastors to, to get alone and have some time with God, not understanding what that meant to go to a monastery. I actually walked in with my laptop, my cell phone, I mean all my electronics, got to my room and, and there's no electrical plug. Um, so when I went and found a priest and asked him where the electricity was, he just laughed at me. And he looked at me and he said, you're at a monastery. And I'm like, so what? You know, where's the electricity? Uh, he said, uh, there is none in your room. Uh, we don't want you to have those things. We want you to have time alone with God. Uh, 
from that, I w went to a session one day where they said, we want you to go out into the forest by yourself, take your Bible in hand, find a psalm, one psalm, read it and meditate on it for two straight hours and then come back and tell us what you learned. Now, I'm a pastor who gets paid to study. I can study for two, three, four hours, no problem. You, you want me to go focus on a psalm for two straight hours while I'm sitting on a log in the forest? Uh-huh. I'm like, okay. So I, I went off into the forest, uh, found a, a, an old log, sat down, uh, found a psalm, and I focused on that psalm for two straight hours. I, I must say that uh, it, it was an amazing time because God spoke in a profound way. As I listened to him, as I thought about him, I poured over the words. Meditation. Is that the kind of person that you are, where you're spending purposeful time alone with God? When you do that, when you are a wise person, uh, how does God view you? It says in verse 3, this person, he says, is like a tree planted near the streams of water uh, that yields fruit in season. Its leaves never wither. Uh, whatever he does prospers. Um, I love this verse as a, as a former landscaper because I understand the value uh, is if you plant a tree, you better have a water source that goes to the tree. Uh, and I used to install sprinkling systems when I was uh, younger, and I used to install um, drip systems. Uh, because you want to get water to those trees to make sure they're productive. So I understand this motif of, uh, of a tree being planted by a river. Because uh, what the Jews would do back in the day is they would find a river and they would form canals off of it. And then they would plant trees along the canal bank to make sure those fruit trees were profitable. Uh, Jesus is telling us through this, the pen of the psalmist, that's a wise person. That's a wise person. They've planted themselves, the river here being the word of God. They plant themselves by the river of the word of God. And that word feeds them throughout their entire lifetime, feeds their soul. It gives them answers to the questions of life and helps them understand life. It helps them understand how to praise God, uh, how to talk to God, how to listen to God. Uh, that feeds them. It's, it's food for the soul. But what's interesting is he says that the, when you're planted in the word of God like that and becoming wise... You yield fruit in season. And well, what does that mean? Well, from what I've learned as being a tree planted in the word of God, uh, is sometimes when I read the word of God, uh, I think, well, what does that mean for me today? Uh, and sometimes later in the day, something happens uh, that I encounter where God takes what I read early in the morning and says, uh, this is why you read that. I'm, I'm going to give you insight right now that you need to talk to that person about whatever the topic was. Some, sometimes uh, you don't find that fruit until weeks later, years later, but God's always using that word as you're studying it uh, to bring you to a time of producing fruit for him, but it's, but it's in due season. And he says that this kind of person, uh, whatever they do then prospers. Doesn't mean that you're uh, financially sound, which God can bless you financially. He did Abraham. But he's talking about just your life in general will have prosperity about it. Prosperity in your marriage. A prosperity in how you raise children. A prosperity in how you treat others. Prosperity in how you work. Because if the word of God is that which I am planted by, and it's the water feeding my tree, then I'm going to understand how to treat my wife. How to love her. How to care for her. I'm going to know how to treat my family when I'm a with them 24 hours a day, month on end during the coronavirus. Uh, I'm going to understand how, how to maintain my family life and build a great family life, even in that, because God's feeding my soul. Prosperity. Who wouldn't want that? But what does the world tell you? Well, the world tells you, if you plant yourself as a tree next to the Word of God, uh, you're not going to be living life and enjoying life. I mean, why would you want to do that? Well, you would want to do that because that's the wise way to live. On the other side of the equation, we have the path of the unwise. And from what we know from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the majority of the people are on that path. Uh, what is that kind of path like? What are those people like? Uh, well, notice what uh, the psalmist says. But not so are the wicked. Not so like what? Well, they're, they're not like a tree planted by the river of life, the word of God. What are they like? Well, he uses a different simile here to describe them. He says they're like chaff that's driven by the wind. That's what they're like. They're not a tree that has deep roots that sink down into the, the water and the nutrients from the word of God. No, they have no roots whatsoever. They're like chaff. Well, what is chaff? Well, in a military church full of uh, officers who fly uh, fighter planes and things, uh, you're automatically thinking ch chaff is what you drop as a countermeasure to an incoming missile. Uh, well, that's one way to look at chaff, but biblical chaff is, is all about farming. Uh, here's a picture of some wheat. 
Uh, and you can see the little kernels uh, that hold the, 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 the wheat. Uh, that's what you want at harvest time to come out of there. And so when you would have a giant basket and throw all the wheat in, onto the basket and, and then move the basket up and down uh, to, to, to separate the two, as the wheat, which is heavier, would drop down to the bottom of the basket, the, the outer shell, the thin little shell, would break apart uh, and be released and drop the seed and then the wind would blow the, the worthless piece away. That's chaff. God says the person that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't believe in me and doesn't plant their tree by the, the word of God and seek wisdom from the word of God, uh, they're like that. They're, they're like chaff that's blown away that's worthless. They might be here for the moment serving a purpose but spiritually they have no roots. Why have they no roots? Because, well, they have pursued their desires, their passions, their dreams, their visions while rejecting God. So they're not wise. What's the end result of that person? He says in verse 5 what their end result is. He's very, very honest, very forthright. He says, therefore, the wicked will not arise at the judgment, one thing. Second thing, nor will sinners, uh, nor will sinners uh, be in the assembly of the just. Two things. So, what's the end result of living a life that rejects God, rejects God's word, and lives for yourself? He says, well, you're, you're foolish. And the end result will be that you will not rise in judgment. What, what does that mean? Well, think about progressive revelation. So, uh, we are told about God judging sinners in the Old Testament. But as we go through scripture and you get to the New Testament, we're given more wisdom on exactly what does that mean. So when you get to the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, you get to chapter 20, verses 7 to 15, you find out that the, the lost of all time will stand before the great white throne judgment of God. And what does he say there? Well, they, they will not arise at the judgment, meaning uh, they, will, they will be accused. They will not be able to stand before Jesus the judge and provide the proper defense to allow them to be seen as just and, and be permitted into heaven. Uh, they, they will not be able to stand in the judgment of Christ. Number two, it says that sinners will not be found in the assembly of the just. So at the end of time, there will not be any sinner who rejected God in God's ways uh, in God's kingdom, in his heaven. Not one. See, today, uh, every church is full of wheat and chaff. Every church. Uh, every school. Uh, every, every, every place. You can find them everywhere. Uh, and they are the majority of the chaff who reject God. Uh, they are all over the place. But in heaven, he says at the end, none will be in the assembly of the just. And, and nor would they want to be there because they love wickedness. Then what's the end result of those who reject God and God's ways and choose foolish things as opposed to wise things? In verse 6, he says, uh, let me give you a word of warning. He says, because the Lord knows the way of the just, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Well, what kind of ruin? Well, ru ruin in the here and now. And that they do not understand how to live in a, a life in a wise way. They listen to all the wrong people and don't choose things that are optimal in the eyes of God, which doesn't lead to optimal living. It leads to ruinous living. And ultimately, they forfeit heaven for an eternity without God. Which path are you on? That's the question of the psalmist. What a great way to start the psalms. He's, God's getting real. Uh, he's getting honest. And he's saying, as you study the psalms, consider which person you are. You, are you a wise person that's going to listen to God and what he says in all the under, other 149 Psalms and want to learn to commune with him and to walk with him? Or are you on the path of the unwise who rejects the things of God, sees them as foolish? Then you'll be like chaff that will blow away on judgment day. Uh, the choice is yours because you have a free will. My prayer as you study the book of Psalms is that you will move from the path of the unwise to the path of the wise and the way that you do that is you come to know well, the God of the Psalms, which is Jesus Christ. And he will make you his son, his daughter, and, and move you from the path that leads to ruin to the path that leads to great blessing. And I pray that many will be on that path. And for those who already know Christ, I pray that you will understand the value of sinking your roots deep down into the word of God so it can feed your soul, especially at a time such as this. Let's pray. God, thank you just for the clarity of the scriptures. Uh, they, they mince no words. They say what needs to be said to us and they teach us. Might we have ears to, to hear uh, and eyes to see what you have said to us. And then 
the desire to go out and, and be obedient to your, your words. We pray for ourselves that we might move toward greater wisdom in our living and might that wisdom uh, be derived from our understanding of the word of God. Place within us a, a great desire, a great joy to read and to study what your scriptures say, realizing that the essence of life is in those words. And we pray for those who don't know you, that they would come to know you and see their need of you, the author of all life, and that they might move from being chaff to being a great tree planted by the river of life. We give you praise for who you are, and we pray that our lives might reflect your image in Christ's name. Amen.